Welcome to the Radical Rhythm Podcast. This has been created for those of us that love radical women who live perhaps by the rules, but also question and challenge the status quo. We want more from our lives, to enjoy our sexuality, to explore radical thought, and to celebrate women who have lived and continue to live unconventional lives. Hi, I'm Dr. Tony Baer, sexologist, educator, activist, and definitely a radical woman. Thank you for joining me as I share stories of women challenging the status quo and living life to the fullest. Join me as we unapologetically march to the beat of a different drummer together. Welcome to the Radical Rhythm Podcast. Today, I have a special guest and good friend, Kara Griswold. And Kara, thank you so much for coming on. I have never had a holistic sex educator here, and especially somebody who is a friend and has a podcast. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And I am really looking forward to finding out where you are in your project uh, with sex and MS. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with a podcast called Sex and and MS and the, the program that you're doing? Well, thank you for inviting me to talk about it. I really, um, it is, was maybe a bit of a winding path, but that's how life is. I, I started out, um, I got some continuing education, went back to school in 2019 to get uh, in a certified uh, sex educators program. And so um, I started a, podcast and started a business that was just about sex, you know, just broad sex education, but sex education is a huge topic, like oceans and oceans and oceans of information and, and things to talk about. And I needed for my own well-being and just, yeah, for my own peace of mind, I needed to narrow it. And I ended up deciding to narrow it to MS and sex. And that's actually the name of the podcast, MS and sex. And um, because I am a person with MS and I uh, know it, I've had, I was diagnosed with MS almost 30 years ago. So I know a thing or two about it. And I know a thing or two about how, how it affects your life and your sexuality. And um, I decided to, change my focus to that. I, I also another one of the things that was a real really spurred this on was I I went to my one a neurologist that I had, not my current neurologist, but I went to them when I was having uh, some sexual response issues and I suspected that it could be neurological. And so um, the response that I got was so dismissive. And um, I just really saw the need there. And so what I'm doing now is education for people with MS and other chronic neurological issues, as well as the healthcare providers that serve them. Because I think we've all been to the doctor and tried to bring up sexuality and gotten that deer in the headlines. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I think healthcare Practitioners are just not given the tools or the education to address the issues that we, sexuality issues that we bring to them. So. That's fantastic. I, I didn't do this on purpose, but the podcast right before this is uh, centered on brain trauma um, injuries, uh, TBIs, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and resiliency and reinventing ourselves. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And... Um, ah. Yeah, I'll have to cool. listen and, to that. Yeah. 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 It just it just went up. And okay. um, and I and, and now we're going to talk about MS. So you know, there are so many challenges life yeah. gives us. Mm -hmm. And um having a chronic illness definitely is one of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, when you if you have MS, uh when you get um lesions in your brain. 
that is brain damage. That does cause damage to your brain. And so some of the issues may be similar to some of the things that your last guest was talking about. And since we're talking about this, I think a lot of people, I might just really briefly explain what MS is and how it affects the body, if, if you would okay. like. So uh, MS is a chronic neurological condition and it's an autoimmune disease. Um, so what happens is your, your immune system kind of gets out of control and begins to attack uh, the myelin sheath of your neurons. And these neurons can be anywhere in your central nervous system. That's your brain or your spinal cord. Sometimes they can happen even in your outside of the spinal cord in your peripheral nervous system. Um, but um, so neurons are, um, are covered with a, a a sheath called a myelin sheath and it's kind of like insulation kind of like uh like white electrical wiring has insulation around it that helps that electrical impulse go more quickly and so that's what the myelin sheath does and when your immune system attacks that that electrical impulse can either can slow or even if it gets bad enough stop so that your brain is not getting the message uh, from your body or it's not able to send you know messages your brain is not able to send messages to your body or your body to your brain so that's what it messes yeah yeah every once in a while my sister my younger sister and i compare notes um i had um a fall last mm -hmm. year or maybe the year before the beginning of covid and um, I had a mild traumatic brain injury and they found two small, I don't think I told you this, they found two small um, brain tumors on the outside oh. of my, my wow. brain. And wow. they're small, you know, and mm -hmm. my youngest sister has MS. Oh, and okay. she says, um, and she's 52 and I'm 59. Mm -hmm. And um, and we, we compare notes. Um, she mm -hmm. calls it sometimes... Her brain feels fuzzy, like there's a whole bunch of bees um, yes. buzzing around. Yes, I get and, that. <laughs> and uh, we, we refer to my brain tumors <laughs> as peas, like I have two little <laughs> peas. So she has bees and I have And you have peas. <laughs> you I know? just said that to my partner yesterday. I was having a day that was just so fuzzy. And I told her, I tried to explain it. I said, it's like all the thoughts in my brain are just like zzz, like but you know like bubbling and running into each other and i can't get a hold of any of them and so i will have those cognitive uh fuzz days and i have a couple of episodes actually i think three on brain fog and how that affects sexuality um so your sister might be interested in that if she has that kind of brain fog that i know well too yeah, no, I will definitely not only share that with her, I'm going to share your links underneath our podcast here on YouTube. So it'll be great. Um, it'll be great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, everything, everything is so connected. So mm -hmm. when, you know, are there like episodes that you have that are worse than other times? Um, you know, is there an ebb and flow to chronic pain? Um, how does MS affect day-to-day -day living or your MS? Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's very individual and it does, um, it affects everyone differently. How does it affect me? Um, it is, uh, I am at a pretty good place right now. Um, I am on a good medication that has made a big difference for me. It, um, it's called Casimta, and what it does is it shuts down all of my B cells. So part of my, an important part of my immune system is just shut down, which has been a dangerous thing during COVID. I've had to be extra, extra careful. So that's a big effect for me. I just have to be extremely careful uh, to not get COVID. Um, but uh, it, for me, it is, um, I have severe fatigue. I have brain fog. My legs and my arms will not work exactly right sometimes. I don't have, you know, um, I, I'm at a place where I can go on um, walks and, and 
hikes now and I live in a really beautiful part of the United States. I live in the Pacific Northwest. And there was a long period of time where I, I was not feeling well enough to go on like walks or hikes. Um, but um, walks or hikes, did I say that right? <laughs> like, so I have yeah, not a good to miss. But now I, um, I have recently picked up walking sticks, you know, like hiking sticks. And um, so I can go on, on walks. I can um, ride my electric bike. Um, so I'm, I'm at a good place. And I'm at that good place, I believe, because of the medication that I'm on, but also just the, um, just the emotional place that I'm at right now, which is better than it has been for a while. Um, I, um, I am able to keep my stress levels lower, do, do my best to do that, because when, when I become stressed, stress affects everybody. As you know, it affects you. I'm sure you can feel it. But somebody with MS, you feel it immediately. Your body tells you. When I am stressed or anxious, I will start getting uh, numbness in my body that is so intense or tingling or I'll get super tired or I'll start losing part of my vision or, you know, there's because I've had MS almost 30 years, I've, I've had a, a, probably almost every symptom that you could possibly have. And so what they just ebb and flow now. Okay. But, um, but I, I, but I gonna, keep stress under control. I was going to say, you have a whole podcast about MS and sex. Mm -hmm. And I know, <laughs> is there any way that you can summarize? <laughs> because, uh, um, you know, this is only one episode. Um, how MS and uh, MS affects your sex life? Well, I can summarize that. But what I will tell people is, I'll, and I'll provide this quick summary, but I have um, a good episode on that. And I have a, a little workshop that is a video workshop. And if people will email me or uh, PM me on uh, Instagram, I will send them a link so that they can watch that video for free. And it's a great workshop uh, that just gives you a more in-depth um, look at what I'm about to say. So um, MS affects sexuality really basically in three ways. They consider it primary, secondary, and tertiary ways that MS affects sex. So the primary ways that MS affects sex have to do with, um, are caused by damage to the central nervous system that is directly connected to your sexual response cycle. So that could be neurons that, well, it could be uh, lesions in your brain that affect your, um, the endorphins and chemicals that have to do with arousal and sexual response systems. So if you have some lesion in your brain that is um, in the um, in some part of your brain, and I, I go into more detail in this class, but in some part of your brain that affects your sexual response cycle, that's a primary effect. It could be damage to neurons that are connected to your genitals so that you may have um, uh, lack of lubrication. It can be erectile dysfunction issues, and that can be for penis owners or clitoris owners. Um, erectile dysfunction can happen for both. Um, and, um, or, yeah, so, and then secondary effects are things that, like muscle spasticity or fatigue or um, uh, Digestive issues like uh, urinary, either uh, uh, constipation issues, digestive issues, or urinary tract issues uh, that can affect uh, sexuality. And so if you are retaining urine and you're getting a lot of bladder infections, that affects sexuality. If you're having spasticity in your muscles, um, and it may affect your ability to do the things you used to do in bed. The tertiary effects of MS. Oh, and, and in the secondary category, medication side effects also fit into that category. So the tertiary effects are uh, have to do with kind of the psychological 
and emotional effects of MS, like just dealing with uh, the anxiety of having MS, the unknown and unknowable progression of the disease. Um, it can, it's uh, your, uh, how it just rocks your sense of self. Like when you can't do the things you used to do, when you have to change careers, when you are unable to work, uh, yeah, so uh, it affects your, you know, kind of your sexual self-worth. Um, and then, of course, uh, everybody else's issues around ableism, that affects us too. So those three ways. My sister um, having MS, I've learned that MS, I used to think MS was something physical that you could see, that someone has MS. But I learned from my sister, it's for her, it's an invisible mm -hmm. um, disability, right? That mm -hmm. nobody knows. And she yeah. has some very, very bad days and misses work, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, when, I don't know if you remember when you first dated somebody, uh, you've been with your partner for a little while now, mm -hmm. but um, how, how do you bring it up like with dating? Because it is, for some, uh, an invisible um, challenge. It is, and so I think that 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 is a that disclosure is something that is very individual. Like everybody needs to come out in their own time, and I think that really that has a lot to do with um, how he, how you as an individual are processing it, and how much you've even come to terms with it yourself. I mean, I really. For many, many years, I was in denial. I lived in denial myself about my MS. And that was not good. That ended up really biting me in the butt in a, in a really big way. Like it really caused me to behave in ways that, um, that I ended up with an episode that really almost cost me my life. And so, um, so if you, I was not in a place to even, it was difficult for me to disclose for many, many years. Most people didn't know I had it. It was something I was ashamed of. And um, and so I had to get to a place where I felt okay enough about myself um, that I could share it with other people. And so, you know, some people want to disclose that right away, right off the bat, like this is who I am. And, um, but I, I would say that it is very, individual. I would encourage people to, um, you know, to get to the point where they are okay with their own sense of self around having MS and have faced their own internalized ableism. Because when you face that, you have the confidence and self-esteem to, to be able to know what's your stuff and what somebody else's ableist stuff. So if you tell somebody and they, if you tell somebody that you're interested in or you're thinking about dating and they kind of freak out or they run the other direction, that could really um, damage your self-esteem if you are not um, strong yourself. Did that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does a lot. And I remember meeting you uh, face to face for the first time. And I believe it was downtown Kansas city mm -hmm. and we were having a great big get together and you had the most lovely Victorian house downtown. Mm -hmm. And, uh, many of us stayed there mm -hmm. and uh, you know, in meeting you, you seem to have all the confidence in the world and mm -hmm. a beautiful woman walking down the steps and uh, was the hostess to all of us all weekend. Mm -hmm. A crazy group of women that we were. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, it was a, it was a great weekend. And um, hosting something for the weekend and putting on a party is, you know, I'm guessing there are ups and there are downs. And sometimes mm -hmm. you would feel like that and sometimes you wouldn't. Absolutely. I mean, there are times when that really would not have been an option. And I'll tell you what, 
um, I could not have done that without a huge group of people that helped me do it because I actually wasn't feeling that great at that time uh, or even all that self-confidence. So it's interesting to hear you say that that was your perception because I was not feeling uh well, either emotionally or physically at that time, but it was something that I, what you were doing there was really important to me. And so I really wanted to do it. And I also had to be able to ask for help. So I used to have a really hard time with that, asking for help from people. And so MS has taught me that too, that uh, willingness to be vulnerable and that uh, willingness to say, look, I can't do this by myself and I'm going to need your help. And so I asked, uh, there was a, a large support group that did most of the, all the physical stuff that needed to be done because I wasn't in a place to do it. So, Yeah. And when I think about women who march to the beat of a different drum, um, you come to mind very quickly. And I, I've been waiting to interview you for for a while as I've done this because um, I remember meeting you, you were in, at that time, you were in the field of making films and uh, you had technological knowledge and that's one of my weaknesses. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. great. And then when you started this business um, and you started a podcast, um, I don't think we're in the majority of women, the outspoken women that talk about sex on online mm -hmm. or in public. And our missions kind of go together that we both mm -hmm. want to empower women. Mm -hmm. And do you find, I think at one time we had a conversation about uh, some of the pushback that you had from different mm -hmm. groups in mm -hmm. wanting to start something like this. I think that um, sexuality, um, I, I do this because... Um, because people have a, such a hard time talking about sexuality. They don't have a hard time with um, uh, kind of gratuitous sexuality or um, kind of the, the, yeah, the gratuitous, gratuitous sex that you see on TV. They have a hard time talking about real sexuality. And sexuality forms one fourth of who we are as human beings. So there's um, food and there's you know aggression and there's um, fleeing, you know, that kind of that flight response. And then there's sex. Those four things make up the core of who we are instinctively as human beings. And when you knock out one fourth of that, you're knocking out a huge portion of who you are as a human being. And so we live in a culture that is so erotophobic and so afraid to talk about sexuality, erotophobic and ableist on top of that. So not only should we not talk about sex, but if you're a disabled person, God forbid you should think of yourself as sexual. I mean, yeah, we people that are disabled are often really inf infantilized in this culture and seen as like not sexual beings. And I'm here to tell people that if you are a disabled person or you have a chronic illness and you want to keep that spark of sexuality alive, that alone makes you a radically sexy person. And I am here to support you in that um, because I know it's hard. Um, when I tell people that I'm a sex educator, I get all kinds of responses. People will just turn and walk away or they you know, get very uh, kind of, I don't know, they get really sort of um, rude about it. And so I know that's their issue, not mine. Right. I, I'm finding that people, I, I'm not getting that rude thing, but I, you know, I hang out with pretty progressive people. I'm very lucky. And where I live is not progressive, but I don't hang out with them. I share a shopping cart. That's about it. <laughs> right. Right? But what I've found lately is when I go to a business meeting or a organization of women, business women or a retreat, um, everyone's fascinated with having a sexologist in the room. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, during the time we're together, I get pulled into the corner and asked a question about them, uh, their sex life and their, mm -hmm. their partner. And, um, mm -hmm. and 
there are a lot of people that really want just one or two questions answered. Mm -hmm. uh, folks want to know if they're normal or they're not normal mm -hmm. or, yeah. you know, yeah. that I want to do this and my husband doesn't want to do that. Um, am I okay? You know, am I a, mm -hmm. a good person, even though I want to do this crazy sexual position hanging from the chandelier and going across the room? And, um, and I think we all just, we are sexual beings and we want to express ourselves, mm -hmm. but sometimes religion or mm -hmm. community or family just really yeah. stigmatizes the sex act. It does. It really does. And it's really, yeah, it, it can really, um, it takes a lot of energy to, um, to, to fight that kind of erotophobic ableist message off all the time. And so I think it's important to surround yourself by supportive people who see you. If you are a disabled person in particular, and that's what I'm talking about today, you know, and in my work, if you're a disabled per person, it is important to surround yourself by people who see you as a the strong, complex, sexy person that you are. And so, um, because we do get a lot of negative messages all the time. And um, yeah, so just find people to um, that see you as the sexy person you are and, you know, listen to sex positive podcasts made just for you. And um, yeah, the classes are there. Um, yeah. And you talk about kind of people wanting to feel like they're normal and I mean, I think I think uh, I talk a whole lot about alternative sexualities or even like what people some people call kink. And I think that I have a theory <laughs> that people who have chronic illnesses um, or disabilities may be even might be more interested in alternative sexualities than other people because it is edgy. And, you know, we um, People who are disabled are not, we, we're not afraid of pain or difficulty or the darkness that is part of being human because we face it every day, every day. And so um, I think, yeah, it is, it's, it's interesting. I have, I have a little theory about that. I haven't, I haven't done the research to back that up, but I might just do that someday. That could be the next book. <laughs> Right. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And um, so, you know, we're coming to a close, unfortunately, for today, because I'm thinking about five more questions that I know would absolutely light you up and mm -hmm. we could talk forever. Um, if somebody wants to find out more information about what we've talked about today, which is mm -hmm. MS and sex and um, ableism and mm -hmm. erotophobia, I think I mm -hmm. said that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, how could they get a hold of you, Kara? So um, my my website is msexualhealth.com. So it's uh, MS sexual health, but there's only one S. So msexualhealth.com. You can email me at info at msexualhealth.com or you can find me on Instagram at ms and sex. It's all one word. And I would love to hear from people. I would love to uh, hear questions that people have. You can email them to me. You can PM me on Instagram. Uh, and if you want to post those other questions on my Instagram page or PM them to me, I'm sure somebody else is wondering those, you know, may have those same questions too. And I will be happy to post the answer on Instagram. There are so many topics we could talk about. I and know. I hope that you'll come back again. I, I would love to. I would love to. I miss, I miss hanging out with you. Someday we'll see each other face to face again. We shall. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Radical Rhythm podcast today. It has truly been my pleasure to invite guests and talk to you about my passion the joy in our sexuality, and radical women who march to the beat of a different drum. 
If you'd like to work with me, Dr. Tony Baer, I have a community where I give seminars every month. I also have a coaching program, both group and individual, and also a course, a self-directed course, because it's all about experiencing the joy life has to offer. I'd love to work with you. Check out my link below, www.tonybeareedd.com. See you next week, and don't let anyone dim your shine.